and I will be vodcasting it just in case you watch it and you think, man, I'd really like to know more about teaching again, uh, maybe tomorrow, and you want to sit down and rewatch it, I'll let you know where I will vodcast um, this presentation. So some of you have looked at this title, and I hope you've thought, wow, I guess Rachel's sort of inspired by Antony Van Leeuwenhoek, who was um, it, not a classically trained scientist, actually, in the late 1700s. He was, or in the late 1600s, late 17th century. He was actually a draper and a haberdasher, a, ma a maker of men's clothing. And he had a great little pastime, and that was building microscopes. So he really got into this idea of making an even better microscope that could allow him to magnify around two to three hundred times and so he could start to see a whole new world out there that wasn't really seen before. And that's what inspired my title because I believe that students are a whole world of diversity that in many cases have not been discovered and that they have diverse learning styles, they have unique niches in, when they, in which they do their best learning. And so towards those ends, I have actually a quote that I would like to read to you um, from a 1676 publication in the Philosophical Translations. It was from a letter that Antony Van Leeuwenhoek wrote to the Royal Society of London. And so this is um, the actual picture from the English translation, and I'm going to read it to you here. Uh, in the open court of my house, I have a well which is about 15 foot deep. Before one comes to the water, it is encompassed with high walls so that the sun, though in cancer, yet har can hardly shine upon it. This water comes out of the ground, which is sandy, with such power that when I have labored to empty the well, I could not so do it, but there remained ever a foot's depth of water in it. This water is in summer time so cold that you cannot possibly endure your hand in it for any reasonable time. Not thinking at all to meet with any living creatures in it, uh, it being of good taste and clear, looking upon it in September of last year, I discovered in it a great number of living animals, very small, that were exceeding clear, and a little bigger than the smallest of all I have ever saw. And I think, that in a grain of weight of this water, there was above 500 of those creatures which were very quiet and without motion. I read to you this quote because I think it is a great example of looking for things in places where we never expected to find them, and yet finding diversity there and finding the unexpected. And that's what I hope my talk can center around today is looking for student voices in unexpected places, finding unique niches in which, and sometimes even extreme, by our estimation, niches, where they can express themselves, where we can hear their words, and where we can do a better job of individually addressing their learning needs. So I'm going to talk about a few projects that have been going on in the general micro, medical micro labs, and even a little bit in Principles of Biochemistry, which I also teach. So this is a picture, actually, of some of my students who are currently taking the class. Um, they, they wanted to be very much included in this presentation when I told them that I was going to get to talk to all of you. And so um, just a few of them here, maybe, uh, I hope, uh, looking at a little bit of diversity, um, we have on, on the left is Haley, and she uh, actually is very, very interested in wild cats. She um, has done uh, several research projects studying wild cats. Um, the two ladies in the middle um, are interested in agriculture. Stacia over on the second from the right is interested in engineering. Um, and Felicia is a cross-country runner, so she's very athletic. So these are some unique students that are, are currently taking microbiology. So my argument, I guess, is that with our, our words of Antony Van Leeuwenhoek, we can hopefully um, address the diverse needs that they have, take the sort of detailed, um, descriptive discourse to our science of teaching that we have taken perhaps to some of our microbiological approaches. So the first one that I want to talk about today is my recent pas passion for qualitative research. 
And I know that actually in the hard sciences, uh, some of you look at that word and it's, it's immediately like, oh my gosh, qualitative must have less value. And so I've, I've been starting to integrate some qualitative research methods into my teaching, um, which have been very successful actually and very descriptive. And one of the things that I do, and, and I'm guessing that Nancy especially has already done things like this, um, is that this is the low tech side of things. I collect note cards from all of my students at the very beginning of the semester. And I think a lot of teachers do that, but on those note cards, I have them write one of their passions. And I also have them define for me bulimic learning. And we talk throughout the semester about what that means, and we try to avoid it. Um, but right here is a picture on the left that I took of a stack of the current note cards. And it just happens that as these rolled out, Sarah Legs ended up on the top. And she says, I know it's nerdy, but my passion is molecular biology. And <laughs> um, Sarah is here today. So obviously, that is one of her great passions. So what I do with these passions really is what I think makes a difference. And that is that I never put these note cards away. So absolutely every day I sit down with them. The very first day I sit down with them and I put them into themes. So I have a stack for students who are interested in you know, animals, students who are passionate um, about skiing, students who are passionate perhaps about rodeoing, right? Um, and so we end up in the end with these great stacks with themes. I put labels on each theme. First, I find out how many students have maybe the, the overarching passion um, of that particular semester. So we might end up with more this semester who are interested in veterinary me medicine than anything else. So at that point, I can take my curriculum and I can say, hey, how can I um, design this to actually engage this great group of, of students who are interested in this particular thing? And so I use that not every day before I lecture, I delve into the stack and I say, what are two students, like who are two students that I could involve in lecture today? And I try to find a way to, to take the content and make it emotional to them. And Ledoux has done a lot of studies over the past 15 years. He's worked on the emotional, the emotional mind. And in 2007, he published in Cell, and he showed that, in fact, yes, there is a link between emotion and learning. So if we can emotionally engage students in what they're learning, we can see an enhanced you know, knowledge base at the end of the semester. So we find ways to bring them in. And um, I actually should mention right here in this right-hand picture, Kelsey is the TA in the yellow coat. Uh, and she's, uh, she's here today as well. Um, and then my two other students, Shannon on the left, Emily on the right. Emily is very passionate about sled dog racing. So the other day, we got to talk about Staph aureus infections. And I was able to bring uh, Emily in talking about abscesses that she has experienced in her sled dogs. So this is a great, not very technologically savvy, if you will, um, method of reaching and hearing diverse voices. But keeping that going all semester long, writing questions about the students so that when they see them on the homework assignment, you know, I've had students come up and say, Rachel, I've never been featured on an exam before. <laughs> and then that way they're emotionally engaging in that content. Okay, the next one now starts to get a little bit more internet based and a little bit more technology integration. Um, this is a project that we actually be began more than five years ago. It's actually become about six years now. And we began designing virtual labs or dry labs to complement all 26 of the wet labs. So I've um, with much help uh, from Christy Boggs, who's actually um, in instructional technology, she's an instructional designer, we've put together um, virtual content to complement every one of the labs. And it includes uh, everything ranging from interactive sort of uh, you know, labeling or um, tests that you can kind of say, OK, what's the answer here? And the, the students can interact with it to video content, to text content. So students can access both before and after the lab, the virtual version. So they come to lab having seen already that which you're, they're going to work on that day. So we finished finally these 26 labs. It was a lot of plugging and chugging and plodding along. 
And we decided, wow, we need to see if these actually are um, you know, effective in allowing students perhaps to replace what was the traditional means of instruction prior to that with uh, the use of the virtual edge and a, and a pre-lab using that virtual edge. So we did that um, in the spring semester of 2009. We actually did um, a non-randomized pre-test, post-test design in which we tested as our experimental group the virtual edge. And, and this is just a few pictures here of what the virtual edge has to offer. Um, I just took a quick video. Here's one where you can interact with the components of the microscope. You can touch it, it's highlighted. You can find out what that is and what it does. So the students can study it prior to coming to lab. Um, the other things that you might find on here include things like a Pipette Man tutorial. So click on this tutorial. You can work through it. You can look at pictures of the Pipette Man prior to using them. Uh, practice with it, you know, knowing whether you're reading it correctly before you come to lab or even after you've done that lab, you know, maybe before the practical exam. Um, so those are just a few select examples. And then I'll show you too um, the video component where we've actually, um, you're not going to hear the, the audio very well on this because I, I just caught it without audio. But there is audio and video seeing, you know, what are you going to do today? And the kind of visual um, element of seeing it prior to doing it can make a really huge difference in, in coming into lab knowing what it is you're supposed to do. Because a lot of times you don't even know how to pick up an inoculating loop, much less use it. So if you can actually see it beforehand, it really helps a lot. So these are just a few select examples of the things that we've included on Virtual Edge. And this is the um, actual experimentation that we did. It was, a, it's called a quasi-experimental uh, design where we, we kept students in their preformed groups. That's a bit for convenience. It's also a, a bit because of ethical concerns of providing uh, certain student groups with one thing and others with another. So we actually did this um, quasi-experimental pre-test, post-test design where we put students um, into one group that used virtual edge and did a pre-lab prior to the lab. And then we had one group that did the traditional method, which was essentially to just take a quiz. I mean, you know, how many of you guys have done that in lab, right? You come in, you take a quiz, right? Yeah, okay, it's like, not that much fun, right? <laughs> um, so, I know, boo. <laughs> exactly. And so this is definitely not the student's preferred way to prepare for the day. So the experimental group engaged in virtual content, did a pre-lab prior to the lab using that virtual content, and then they came in and did the lab. The control group did the original you know, quiz, paper-based quiz format. And although it was a small, uh, a small effect that we saw in the post-test scores, we did do a uh, linear uh, ANCOVA and we looked at the statistical you know, significance here and it was a significant finding. So we were able to make the conclusion that in fact uh, there was an effect of using the virtual edge and that it was positive and that um, seemed to have um, supported our hypothesis that using the virtual edge would be a very um, beneficial way to go about things. At this point, the virtual edge and the use of pre-labs has replaced uh, quiz-based in all of my lab sections. And anecdotally, I've gotten a lot, a much more, a, a huge number of students who come to me and say, oh my gosh, Rachel, this is amazing. I mean, I can see what it is I'm doing prior to doing it. And uh, particularly, students with learning disabilities approach me in, a, in an unrepresentative amount because uh, many times reading something like the lab procedure prior to doing it is much harder than watching it. Um, and uh, one of my recent students who has dyslexia found it very, very, um, very, very easy to watch it and engage it with this content as opposed to the reading. I also want to mention just briefly that one of the other things we did with this uh, experiment is we, we also wanted to know whether their dexterity and actual lab skill would change. And we did not find a significant difference between that. So using kind of a rubric-based assessment there, we didn't see that they were actually more dexterous or um, more able to do a good T-streak play. Um, so that was the same between our control and experimental group. Okay. 
So I want to share with you just a little bit of results as far as student perceptions of this virtual edge. And they were very positive. So when we surveyed the group, uh, more than 80% of the respondents agreed or strongly agreed that virtual edge was a valuable resource that made them feel more prepared for and efficient in performing the wet lab. So we um, got good feedback from the students as far as their satisfaction level with that virtual tool. Okay, so at this point, um, I know everybody's kind of like it's mid-afternoon, you just ate lunch and you're thinking, oh man, this is starting to get boring. Who wants to hear about education? Um, so I, <laughs> I'm hoping that everybody did bring with them their cell phone today um, because I want you to pop that out, get your cell phone out um, here at this point. Because we're going to do a quick cell phone poll. So this is a tool for those of you who do a lot of teaching. And um, has anybody used the classroom response system? OK, good. So um, for those of you who have used that, this is somewhat comparative in that it's allowing you to get feedback from your students. Um, and it's, it's allowing for this, the, the students to engage and feel like a little more interactive on any given day. So I'm just going to start this poll, which is a simple one that says, you know, I allow cell phones in the classroom. Or if you're not a teacher or an instructor of something, um, do you believe that cell phones should be allowed in the classroom? So here's how this works. You'll send a text to 22333. When you're ready to answer, then put in the text that you send is the number there. So if you just say, hey, no, get those cell phones, right? There's a great YouTube video where they show the instructor grabbing a cell phone. From, Have you seen that, Randy? Yeah, and he just throws it on the ground, and then he stomps on it. Um, so if you're thinking, no, definitely no cell phones in the classroom, you know, then you would go one, two, five, four, three, one. Okay, we've got a few results there. <laughs> right now, the tool that I have maxes out at 30 because it's free. This is a free web 2.0 tool that you can get online, um, and it doesn't cost me anything to use it. And better yet, with that, it doesn't cost the students anything to buy the little clicker that they would need to buy to bring to class. So that's kind of a neat thing. So I thought, I've done you know, this for a couple semesters, and I thought, let's get a pulse on where my current students sit as far as their, um, their perceptions of the cell phone polls. And so I, I went ahead and did that. Uh, I did a quick poll to find out how they liked the polls. No, I actually did an online survey. Um, so we're starting to get a, a number here coming out, around 58% of you thinking that, maybe 55 thinking that maybe those cell phones are OK in the classroom, 35 maybe not. So it's a little bit split there. Definitely OK. There are pluses and minuses to cell phones in the classroom, for sure. OK, I'm going to pop back over and show you what my students think of cell phone polls. Um, go, go, before, <laughs> right? <laughs> I know what you're saying. OK. <laughs> All right, so we're going to pull up. <laughs> we're going to pull up what my students say here. Uh, cell phone polls um, were by 72% of my respondents. They felt that they really enjoyed using cell phones in the classroom. 73% preferred using their cell phone to the classroom response system. So this is interesting and. My, um, my hypothesis as to partly why this is, is because, heck, let's face it, we've got ownership over our cell phones. I mean, I've, I've been walking around the lab lately t taking some pictures of students with their cell phones. And man, they've got the best little like jewel studded cases for them. And you know, just the incredible individualization that they put into their cell phone. And so I, I had them, um, there was a free area for them to respond on this, on this survey. And so I went ahead and had them you know, write in any comments or thoughts that they might have about this. And I loved this one. 
They are better than clickers because one, you don't have to buy new batteries all the time. You just have to recharge. And two, we already had phones, so we didn't have to buy something new. And three, I never forget my phone. It is my life, <laughs> OK? So this is pretty extreme. It is my life. So what could be more of bringing a student emotionally into the content than having them use something that is their life <laughs> to respond to um, a poll you know, regarding uh, their understanding? And the great thing, too, for me about these surveys is that I, I get to have a pulse on the class. And that's the same as classroom response system. But, um, but I get that idea of, you know, where are we? The other day we were talking about the LAC Operon, and, and I had to pause for a minute, do a quick poll, and said, OK, yeah, you know, we're about 70% understanding this. You know, so let's review real quick and head on, because I know we're mostly there. So it's, it's good for, um, from both sides in many respects with regard to the cell phone usage. Okay. Please, yeah, and you guys, please do interrupt me. <laughs> Right, right, right. So at this point, the clickers are a little bit more of a quantitative tool for the instructor with regard to um, matching a student to a number and having that rec record of their attendance, if you will, um, and whatnot. So cell phones don't match up quite that way. There are some tools that you can um, you, that you can get that will help with that, um, but it's not quite as you know quantitatively valuable to you. So no, it's a great question. Very, very much. Yeah, please, you guys just hit me with them as they come to your mind. I don't mind at all. So. Do they have a question yeah. um, right, right. And so every once in a while, on one of those surveys, I'll get the comment, you know, I don't have a texting plan, and gosh darn it, I'm not going to buy one. And that's okay for me because I I am not. So for my purposes, I'm not taking attendance, and I'm, I'm not looking for, you know, tying a student to, and, and a lot of people harped on me for a really long time, you know, Rachel, you need to get that classroom response system, and I, I just had a hard time with the fact that it made each student a number, and so that, um, you know, that seemed to me to reduce them you know, to sort of one in a crowd or, or number 455 in a crowd or whatever it might be. Um, so, yeah, so I fought it a little bit with respect to that. So that's a great question. So would this so. class just be better for a younger audience than, say, yeah. Beginning yeah, right, right, right. So, you know, depending upon, you know, the audience that you have. And um, for, my, for my gen micro class, right now, I have 125 students. And um, a majority of them are traditional, though I do have some that are non-traditional. And it, I, what I should do is actually sit and talk with them individually and see you know, whether they're feeling differently about the, the polling. Yeah, it's a great question. Very good question. All right, cool. Anybody else thought, ooh, you know the other thing you can do with cell phones is actually, um, this is great because I really got my own one day. One day, he's here today. Um, Jacob. One day Jacob was texting in the middle of lab, like right in front of me. Um, you know, he's sitting right here and he's texting. And so I called him out on it. And I said, you know, so Jacob can't even pay attention. He's texting through class. And he said, no, actually, I was texting Google to find out the definition of quorum. And I found the definition. And the def definition is enough people grouped together to make a decision. So when we talk about quorum sensing, right, ladies up there, we're talking about a high enough concentration of cells that we start to see the signaling. And so in fact, he was further engaging in the content at that moment. He was taking it a step farther. He was, he was taking his understanding to another level that would allow him to apply that content. So I really, you know, amongst other things, that was a moment where I sat and thought for a little while. And um, I, I had never not allowed the use of cell phones, but at that moment I realized that what students are doing on their cell phones, or what you ladies might be doing on your computers up there right now, might be to further engage in the content. Maybe you've already looked up polleverywhere.com and you found out how much it costs if you want a license for 500 students, right? And you're further taking my, you know, whatever it is that I'm saying to another level that might be applied to your life. So, awesome, very good. 
Okay, now um, in the, the last bit here, I actually want to talk about something, oh sorry. This blue box right here uh, represents a very, something that's been going on uh, for a while in, in my lab, and that is podcasting and vodcasting. So how many of you access a daily vodcast or podcast um, regarding, you know, content? Hey, Amber, right? Nice. Good, good job. Uh, so these daily podcasts and vodcasts are awesome, you know, as far as keeping up with um, scientific material or even just your, you know, your daily news. So what I do, um, and I have to tell you that this was driven initially by necessity because one of the other things that I do besides teaching is that I coach the cross-country ski team. And so in, in that effort um, during the spring semester, I have to be away when the students compete in their national competition. And so for many years, for several years, I had a guest lecture. And, you know, bless my guest lectures, my students hated them. You know, and they tell me, Rachel, don't ever leave me with that guy again. And, and so I was like, well, gosh, what am I going to do? You know, how am I going to handle this? So I started um, vodcasting for the period of time that I was gone. And I started getting feedback on these vodcasts. So I have about a two-minute clip that I'm going to show you of a vodcast and just get that moving here. This blue box right here represents a very special sequence called the promoter. Now, obviously, it's not actually a blue box. It's actually got a sequence, a sequence of nucleotides on it that allows for the recognition of the region next to the gene. So a promoter is a very important sequence because it serves as an initiation site. Remember how we talked in replication about the ORIC being the landing pad of all of the factors required to allow replication? Well, in transcription, the promoter serves that role. In so I also have a tablet that I can write on to, to um, as I'm making these. Yeah, so that's what you're going to see here in a minute. So it is the initiation site at which that complex assembles. What's really interesting is that sometimes the promoter controls more than one gene. I'm going to draw a quick picture of that where we might have a DNA region where there is more than one gene. Here in the picture on the left, I've only shown one gene. But in my picture on the right, I'm going to add in some more genes. So and I'm going to say we have... I just wanted to play that long enough so that you could see that um, one of the tools that I have there is actually this little tablet. I think it cost me about $250. And it's great because I can write on it and I can actually, I've got my little Webster box here. Um, so if, you know, something comes up and we need to, to highlight something in particular, I have a highlighting tool or I can write um, on the tablet. And it's really nice to be able to interact with what are often very static slides. And maybe you do want to add something to that day's lecture, and that enables that. So that was um, a vodcast, which essentially means that it's both video and audio. Students go to a site called iTunes U. They log into iTunes U. Um, once they're logged in, they can go and find my class. And they click on the class. And there they find the pertinent vodcasts for that particular semester. So they can get those. So for about three semesters, I simply did some pilot surveys, finding out how students liked these. And I got really great feedback. So this is just a summary of that. Survey data over the course of three semesters indicated that a majority of students agreed that they learned the material presented in the vodcast as well as that presented in traditional in-class. But students also said, I don't prefer vodcast. I mean, I don't want you to really go away, Rachel. I, I kind of like you to stay. But I like the flexibility that vodcast provides. So I can rewind the vodcast. I can fast forward the vodcast. I can re-watch a confusing part like five times if I want to. And so we have done a couple things with that now. One of those is that I took that information and I used it to create a fully online vodcasted principles of biochemistry course. So my principles of biochem course is all online and they have access to any lecture they'd like throughout the summer um, in vodcast form so they can go home if they want to um, and they can still have every lecture that, that might be pertinent to that uh, course. Please, yeah, hit me. <laughs> Rock. Oh, thank 
thank you. Um, yeah, no, it's a great, no, it's a wonderful question. Um, yes, talk to me um, at some point, and yeah, we can definitely get that done. Um, we do have a, uh, there is, when you log in, you do log in as a University of Wyoming student, um, and you get into the Wyoming courses specifically, but we can definitely talk, and there is a way to get access to that uh, if you're non-student. I'm a huge proponent of open courseware, so stop, you know, talk about, I mean, I'm a little contentious in this area. Um, please, yeah. Right, right, right. And, and mine is open. It's just you log in via the open route rather than, so yeah, no, and it's great. And MIT is fantastic. If you guys haven't been to MIT OpenCourseWare, they do a wonderful job. Um, and you can access courses that you know, span the board there. So a fantastic uh, phenomenon in my mind. Okay, so, uh, so the biochem story, right? That's one story, but the other story is what's going on here at home when I'm teaching a face-to-face -face class. Well, we got enough survey feedback to let us know that in fact what we should do is that every day I should vodcast every face-to-face -face lecture. So what I do is each day before lecture starts, I turn on my screen capture tool and I wear my wireless mic around and every day I go home and upload that day's lecture. So the first thought that comes to mind is, oh my gosh, Rachel, does that mean your attendance just goes like this? You know, and you don't have anybody who's coming to class. No. I have a class of 125 and lately I've been getting an attendance of around 95 or 96 students. So I'm still getting the attendance that I would expect to see minus the vodcast. Now I'm guessing there's one or two people out there who prefer the vodcast and I'm okay with that. So um, I guess that is the uh, vodcast story in a nutshell, if you will. And we'll pop along. And I actually want to end things today by talking about something that is really out of the box. And that, um, have any of you ever been on Second Life? Who's stuck? Man, I tell you, you're kicking butt today. Um, all right, so Amber's all over this technology stuff. Um, but in fact, Second Life is a virtual world, also known as a massively multiplayer online environment, or an MMO. This is a place that um, stays all the time. That is to say that no matter whether I'm logged in or logged off, there's a whole world functioning there right now online. When you decide you want to go into Second Life, you make an avatar. And your avatar is a physical manifestation of yourself. Now, for me, my avatar is Seracia. Yeah, the beautiful pigmented gram-negative, okay. Uh, anyway, uh, the gram-negative bacterium, Seracia. Um, that's my name on Second Life. Um, you can make your name your regular name if you want to. Um, and there are many people who like to make their avatar a little bit odd. I mean, there are uh, animal uh, avatars out there um, that are you know, hanging out on Second Life. In fact, one day, it was way cool, uh, this summer, biochem office hours on Second Life, um, we were talking about hemoglobin. We were just trying to get down the concepts of hemoglobin and the hemoglobin oxygen binding curve. And uh, a vampire fittingly walks up to us <laughs> and wants to know if we'd like our first bite. And of course we're saying, well, no, but we're talking about hemoglobin, so you might be interested. Um, so, uh, so Second Life is a fascinating place. Um, not only does it have a lot of, of fascinating people that you might meet with, um, ranging from, you know, one day I was sitting, the only time all summer that I had an office hour that nobody came to. I was sitting there alone crying a little because I always like to have somebody at office hours. And up walks a professor from the university, or from London University, and wants to talk to me about um, online education. So I was able to establish a contact there, as I have been able to do on an island called Genome Island. Genome Island is one of the coolest sites for scientists, um, because it's got things like a virtual cell where you can get inside of a eukaryotic cell, you can interact with the mitochondria, you can interact uh, with the nucleus, you can get information about it. There's a place called Prokaryotic Garden where you can actually click on and touch plasmids from pathogenic microorganisms and see information about them. So it's got a lot of interactive content. Right here, this is a picture um, of me 
I'm staring up at a polypeptide chain, as you guys can see. And that's kind of a neat thing, is to get the sense of size within Second Life. Everything takes on an element of scale. And uh, we can see the sort of immensity of this polypeptide chain. So I'm going to show you another picture along with a quote that came from my summer biochemistry students. So as I mentioned, this summer was the first time that I held office hours on Second Life regularly. So in my summer biochem class, it's an eight-week course, and we ha I have office hours five days a week. Um, two days a week, I have them on Second Life. And only one time did I not have a student attend those office hours. So what was neat about it is that in addition to sitting down and talking about homework assignments, we can you know, go through the homework and get a feel for where everybody is, but on top of that, I then can say, hey guys, let's take a field trip. And we all teleport to, yeah, I know, it's way cool, to another island where we can look at a polypeptide chain. Maybe we can talk about you know, um, protein structure that day or nucleotide structure, and we can look at it. Our avatars can interact with it. So it's a pretty amazing thing. And right now, I've just submitted a tiny grant proposal to the outreach school. Um, to help fund a little more with Second Life. I'm having Second Life office hours for my face-to-face um, -face class right now, too. We meet at 7.30 at night on um, Thursday nights. And I've had pretty good attendance. And this is where I want to wrap back around to the initial slide with uh, the quote by Anthony Van Leeuwenhoek. And that is that there is a student who meets me on Second Life regularly. And he has never talked in class, not a single time. I've never heard his voice in class unless I directly come up to him one-on-one. -on -one. And so in Second Life, he's, he's eloquent in his speech, and he talks a lot. <laughs> yeah, I know. And so it's great because all of a sudden, here's this amazing student who I would have missed completely if I hadn't been there on Thursday nights in Second Life. So um, I want to um, go ahead and, and leave you with a couple of things, I guess. I, I have a list of references just with a little more information from some of the um, people and publications that I've been talking about. And I also do want to take a moment uh, for acknowledgments. This list is very, very partial because um, I've only listed my collabor collaborators and students who have worked on one of these projects specifically. So the undergraduate students are who made it possible for us to do virtual edge. So over the course of those six years, it was one undergrad after another who helped me get video, who helped me um, pull stuff together, who learned Dreamweaver and helped me build web pages. Um, my collaborators in um, outreach credit programs and in the Department of Chemical and Petroleum Engineering are Christy Boggs and Ashley Driscoll. And um, mostly my research is not funded. But the College of Egg has some tiny grants that they give sometimes. ECTL sometimes helps with that. LEARN is the Learning um, Action Resource Network that helps out with things like that. And the Outreach School has been fantastic, too. Um, so that being said, I want to also acknowledge every single one of my undergraduates who are either here today or are now graduate students and here today, um, and John Wolford who always puts up with me, and I couldn't do it without him. So um, thank you guys. Thank you so much for being here. And I'd love to take lots and lots of questions. So OK. <laughs> I know we were asking questions a bit as we went, too. <laughs> Please, so Randy. I, I've run into some of the same things that you've done, but mm -hmm. I didn't know that all these things were out there. Uh, first off, can we you know, get an email so that we can find all these addresses? Yes. So uh, traditionally, when a student comes into my lab and I have them experience something new, I tell them, go watch it on YouTube. Yes. Or see it on YouTube. And then there's another thing called uh, Journal of Visual Experiments, Joe. Mm -hmm. So you can go out there and you can watch the experiment yeah. and, and the person does it right in front of you. Yeah. And then uh, they'll come up to me and say, well, I can't find how to split cells on YouTube. Yeah. So we're in the process of making our own YouTube. Right. Yes, no, that's a perfect point. And um, 
one of the things that I've done with, I'm in the process of doing with the Virtual Edge videos is we're converting them all to YouTube videos so that they are accessible um, out there too. And the coolest thing this summer, I got a uh, comment on one of the YouTube videos just said, this is the best, you know, oil immersion video I've ever seen, you rock, you know, and I was like, thank you, you know, that's, but it's neat to think that they're out there. Um, oh, and another one, I got an email from a student from, I think, Alabama, who just wanted my help with identifying his bacterial unknown because he'd found, like, that online content, and so he was, um, and, you know, so it is so neat with the idea of open course, you know, getting things out so that other people can use them, and yeah, please, yeah. Uh, I just wanted to add some comments about Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so the visual feedback, you know, yeah. Oh, that's, thank you. No, that, thank you very much. Oh, there's a great one out there. Did you guys find the one where they're running through the forest with sticks? No. Oh, this, you need, you need to find, you must find it. It's the best video ever for SDS page. Yeah, yeah, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's, that's a wonderful question. Um, I actually, on my syllabus, it says that my office hours are not private, and um, they aren't, even face-to-face. -face. Uh, I, I often have between five and a full dozen students come to office hours. We all group up. If I need more room, we go into the lab, and we just, you know, bounce off of one another and talk. So all confidential meetings are done separately. Um, but it's a great question as far as confidentiality um, in online courses can sometimes be a little more challenging. Um, and, but there are ways that you can do that via like a confidential chat within the shell. So that's, thank you, that's a great question. Yeah, yeah please. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. We've done everything on our own. So up until recently, there really weren't a lot of rooms set up with video. There are now, our, our new classroom building has more of a, a preset, you know, um, you know, just uh, the, all the logistics are taken care of. But, but in all the work that I've done, we've done it ourselves. And it was, it was actually really neat as we were making the virtual edge, I happened to have a student who is now actually almost done with the Whammy Medical School program. But for whatever reason, she had thought she was going into um, video editing. She, that's where she had wanted to go. And so I managed to pull her into the project and I have some videos that are just beautiful because of her expertise. So yeah, no great question. Yeah, yeah, yes, please. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Sure. So I'm wondering, are you submitting any of your materials to ASM Oh yes. Thank you. Yeah. Um. Right. No. And and uh, so the work that you just saw from Virtual Edge is currently being reviewed for publication in JMB, and fingers crossed. That'll go, and then I'm hoping, and I should talk to you too, I'm hoping that at that point we can collaborate as far as putting it out there for others to, you know, through ASM for others to use. So, um, yeah, yes, um, absolutely. Okay. I have one quick question. Yeah. Um, you're creating intellectual property to some degree. Mm -hmm. Have you had preemptive discussions with the administrators or have you run into issues where the university is? Yeah. No, um, nobody usually tells me to slow down too much, um, but um, yeah, so uh, that's a hard question, and um, the, the only thing that I've done at this point is that um, my, all of my virtual content does say on it, um, you know, essentially that it's for educational use, and all all I ask for it to be used widely is just to contact me and let me know that you're using it. 
So I don't have a lot of, my, my goal is really very open courseware based and, and I, I really hope that it will be usable by many people. Um, and I don't want, I, yeah, but I know as far as with the university that could get sticky and I, d I haven't had those conversations. Yeah. Yeah. Have you, you know, looked at students in terms of their writing ability? Have they gone down? Right. Okay. Yeah. No. That's a great question. I have not assessed like any kind of um, fluid change in writing, you know, ability. Um, but one thing that I will say is that there's that all these virtual labs do is preview, review what they would have done anyway. So we're not replacing anything that they would have done anyway. And, and um, by that, I'm referring partly to none of their lab reports, none of their writing assignments are assessed any differently or done any differently. So they're still submitting, you know, thorough lab reports that we grade and then, you know, so there's no change there. It's really just a preparation for more than anything for practical exams and that sort of practical knowledge and reviewing and previewing it, skill-based, I guess, yeah. That's, that's a good question, though. I haven't done a study like that. So, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much. It's been a huge honor to be here today. So. Yes, it will. Yes. So.